Hello, everyone. Welcome again to our PD Extravaganza 2023 on this Wednesday morning. I am thrilled to welcome Catherine Ritz for this presentation on moving from input to interaction, the IPA framework for learning design. If you have any questions at any time during the presentation, feel free to enter them in the chat and we will get to them. And of course, stick around for the end um, so you can get a feedback form and contribute and you know, give us some feedback on how you thought of this presentation today. Um, and also of course be entered, entered into our giveaway for our PD extravaganza. Thanks again so much for coming and I will hand it off to Catherine Ritz for her presentation. Hi everyone, I'm really excited to be here and thank you so much for joining. Um, I am actually up, I uh, work and teach in the Boston area. I'm at Boston University, but I'm actually up in New Hampshire right now um, at my parents' condo. So I'm sure you all are zooming in from wherever, wherever it may be, work or vacation, but thank you for taking the time to join me um, today. You see on the screen um, a link and a QR code. I'll pop that in the chat as well. Um, so that's a resource folder and I will be adding a PDF of the slides immediately after this presentation. So you will get all of the slides. You're also gonna find a rubric in there and a, um, a document that has some useful links. Um, so rest assured, you will be getting all of this information and you'll see on this slide as well, um, my social media um, tag or whatever it's called, um, as well as that of the co-author, Christina Toro, um, who uh, actually advanced slides with whom I wrote the book uh, that this presentation is uh, partly based on, uh, Proficiency-Based Instruction, Input and Interaction, World Language Education. Um, so Christina and I worked together in the public school district just outside of Boston uh, for many years. So I was the department head, Christina was an out outstanding Spanish teacher. So we worked together for a long time. And then when I started at BU, we've collaborated and stayed in touch over the years. And um, during the pandemic, because you know we had nothing else to do, we decided to work on this project together. Um, and yeah, so we're really excited to share the book as well as material from it. Um, so without, oh, before I start as well, please feel free, as Grant said, if you have questions, pop it in the chat. I can see the chat. Um, if you want to raise your hand, I would just ask you to use the hand up feature because I can't see everybody uh, on my screen all at once, but that should put you to the top of the list. So this is definitely informal. Feel free to interrupt with a question as we go. Um, no worries at all. So hopefully it'll be um, interactive. You can get your questions answered, and I hope you walk away um, feeling ready to accomplish the three goals that you see listed here. So first, my goal, so three goals for this uh, presentation. I really hope you can walk away feeling that you could explain the sequence and the stages of the integrated performance assessment, otherwise known as an IPA. Um, it may not be, it may be something you already have some familiarity with or have tried out, um, but I, you know, I want to, I think it's helpful to go through it and we can um, really think about um, the different stages of it and a really practical approach, I hope, to applying it in the classroom. Additionally, I hope you will be able to describe how the IPA can be used as a framework to design both sort of daily learning experiences as well as larger curricular units. Um, and finally, I hope you'll feel that you can begin to apply this framework in your own teaching. Um, and again, you'll see that link um, and the QR code for the resource slides, and I can make sure I pop it in the chat at the end for anyone who needs it. So these are our three goals for today. Um, and again, interrupt with questions in the chat or using the hand raising feature um, as needed. Um, so let's start with the IPA. So again, this may be something people People have familiar familiarity with. It's been around for a while, and actually the third edition of the IPA book just came out um, from ACFL that has tons of examples of it. Where I think the IPA has been challenging is with its implementation. It can be a very overwhelming assessment um, to administer because I think, but I, but the way sort of I would advocate using it is I, I hope very reasonable and manageable and fits well, and that's the structure we'll be looking at. So first, what is the IPA? So this is um, an integrated performance assessment. And so essentially it's a series of three performance assessments. So we're looking at the three modes of communication, 
interpretive, interpersonal, and presentational. So these modes are linked through a theme. So just really quickly, um, interpretive, um, if you're maybe familiar, I have to give credit to Thomas Auer who taught me these hand gestures, but this is the way you can remember the modes. Interpretive is when you are reading or interpreting, listening, viewing. So it's sort of a one directional communication where you're looking at authentic resource, hopefully, and it's interpreting. Interpersonal, we have a back and forth. So you're listening and responding, listening and responding. Uh, so it's a two-way communication. So you can think of a sort of authentic conversation you may have. Presentational, our hands are going this way. So it's me presenting out. We're back to a one-way communication where I need to be aware of who my audience is, uh, what they may or may not know, et cetera. So with an IPA, we're really trying to take um, these three modes and tie them together with a theme. Um, and think about how we really use language in the real world to communicate. So for example, I might read an article, so that's interpretive. I'm like, wake up in the morning, I like to read the newspaper on my phone or my iPad. So I read an article and then later in the day, I'm like, hey, my friend or whoever, I read this interesting thing. Let me tell you about it. We have a conversation. And then maybe I'm like, you know what? I wanna post a comment because I was really like interested in this and I wanna just respond to the author and I'm into presentational. So we're that sort of article has been linked and that's essentially what's happening with the IPA. Important as part of this as well is that learners are getting feedback. So they know how they, how they did with the interpretive so they can use that information in the interpersonal. They know how they get some feedback on interpersonal so they can use that to uh, accomplish the presentation. So there's sort of a theme that's woven across the three modes. Um, you may be familiar with this graphic. This is from uh, the second edition of the IPA book that talks about those three modes um, and how they are linked um, through this assessment. Um, I, again, I mentioned before where I think the IPA has maybe gotten a bad reputation is in its implementation because if and many teachers, and I did this myself when I first realized like, oh my God, I want to try this IPA. It sounds so exciting. And then I went to implement it and I did like a week, I did at the end of the unit and it was a week long assessment that it was like so overwhelming and exhausting and the grading was hard and the kids were exhausted. And I was like, oh my God, what have I done? This was a nightmare. So splitting the assessments up throughout the unit I actually feel is really reasonable and manageable. And when I made that switch, it it was just made everything a lot more simple to accomplish. So we'll look at that a little bit more closely, closely as we go on. But essentially, this is what the IPA um, is all about. One of the reasons I feel so strongly about using the IPA as a framework for curriculum design and learning design is because of how easily it links together the world readiness standards. So we have the, uh, the five C's and you might be in a state that have, as in Massachusetts, we have our own curriculum framework or standards within the state. Um, but most of them that I'm familiar with all embed in some way, either have adopted or adapted the world readiness standards for the state framework. So hopefully the five C's are relevant wherever you are. So communication, which we just talked about, the three modes, cultures, connections, I think is a confusing C. Connections really uh, talks about connections to other content areas. So are we integrating, um, you know, science, mathematics, literature, history, current events, uh, family and consumer science, art, et cetera. Comparisons really goes with cultures. Are we think, how are we helping learners not only examine culture, but make comparisons with their own culture? And then communities, I think is the, the most challenging C where you're helping learners um, engage with target language communities beyond the classroom. That can be a local community, it can be global, and sometimes it can just be within my own school. I'm helping them uh, uh, engage across classrooms, for example, but really it's sort of a going beyond the classroom. So the IPA, I'm gonna show you an example in a minute, integrates, uh, it can integrate very easily the five C's. So I'll just, one other sort of uh, my own background with curriculum, I started as probably many of us have, if you've been in the profession for a while or even recently, was with a textbook. And the textbook, you know, we just went through the chapters and that's what we did. And it had these nice little overlays of, oh, here's this C, here's that C. 
Um, but I always felt like disjointed and uh, grammar was always sort of had to go first. Culture was an afterthought. There was just a lot of issues that I encountered. Um, and when I sort of viewed the five C's through an IPA lens, I was like, oh my God, here, here's how they're weaving together. And it was so uh, eye-opening for me and really changed my thinking around curriculum because the five C's shouldn't just be, oh, now we're gonna do communication. Now we're gonna do cultures. Now we're gonna do connections. You want them to be woven together. Um, and for me, the IPA has been the, the most sort of seamless and, and while also engaging and relevant way to do that. Let's look at an example, and I'm going to ask you to put um, to think a little bit about it. Um, and I want you to keep your eye out for the five C's. Um, so this is an example of an uh, integrated performance assessment. So my current role is to work with um, uh, practicing or uh, aspiring world language teachers. Yes, I'm putting the slide. Sorry if you missed that, uh, Johanna, at the beginning. They will be in. You see the link at the bottom of the slides. Um, and I'll put that in the chat again for you. Um, at the very end of the presentation, uh, you were, um, I will upload a PDF of the slide, so you'll be getting everything. Uh, so no worries. So this is an example of an integrated performance assessment, what, what I call a frame. So this is the sort of authentic frame for the IPA uh, that one of my students, Francesca Crutchfield Stoker, developed for a Spanish course that she was planning to teach. So I'm going to read this over. Uh, yes, Johanna, as I mentioned, the PDF will be uploaded at the end of the presentation. It's not in there currently, so I will upload it as soon as it's over. Um, as I read through this, I'd like you to keep an eye out. Where are the five C's? Where is communication, cultures, connections, uh, comparisons, and communities? Do you see them? Because this is the frame for the unit. So this is for the entire unit. I would tell the students, OK, here, guys, this is what we're doing in this unit. Um, and then we're going to work through each part of it. And then periodically throughout the unit, they're going to engage in one of those assessments. So see if you can find the five C's. Uh, so you'll be studying abroad next fall in Argentina as part of an exchange program through your high school. You and your friend have been in touch with a student from the high school in Argentina who is going to be your host. The student from Argentina has asked the two of you if you're interested in joining an interest group at their school working to promote gender equality through the use of gender inclusive language. Argentina is known for using gender inclusive language in certain areas, but still has a lot of work to do. To prepare for joining this group, you will do some research on gender equality, stereotypes, and inclusive language in Spanish. First, you'll be reviewing information about gender equality and inclusive language in Spanish speaking countries. Next, you'll be sharing your ideas with your classmates in Argentina to find out what each of you has learned and will be comparing your ideas. Finally, you'll be creating a social media campaign to use at the school in Argentina once you arrive in the fall. In the social media campaign, you'll be creating a hashtag, a short video, and multiple content posts to share with the school to promote the use of gender inclusive language to help combat gender inequality and stereotypes. Okay, so this is her frame of the unit. Do we have the five C's? So this is like, this is the theme for my whole unit. This is the authentic assessment learners are going to engage in. This is going to drive what we do in the unit. Do we see the five C's? So I'd actually love some hand raising. Um, did people identify communications? Those three modes. Would anyone like to share or pop it in the chat? Do we have communication? Did she get interpersonal, interpretive, and presentational? So Mirna says, yes, do you want to sh tell us where you found it? Sure. Uh, well, the interpersonal, um, I can see that they have to share mm -hmm. the ideas with another classmate. Yeah. Uh, but the interpretative, it will be at the very beginning. They have to do some research. And so they have to read and they have to do some research about it. And I'll let someone else do the last part. So presentation. So okay. So you identified interpretive. So we see that here. They're reviewing information on gender equality, inclusive language. Hopefully, this is through the use of authentic resources. And you said interpersonal. They're going to be sharing ideas with a classmate. So there's their interactive back and forth. How about presentational? Did anyone want to comment on that quickly? Uh, 
Oh, oh, sorry, I see Priscilla, you added it in there. Thank you so much. We've got our social media campaign. So we've hit the communication uh, standard with the three modes of communication. What about cultures? Did, did she integrate um, the culture C into this standard? Okay, learning about research, um, definitely. So cultures, I think traditionally we've thought of like the big C culture, festivals, food, uh, et cetera. But really culture, anything from a target culture uh, can be a way to examine culture. So I think certainly learning about what's happening in that country could be considered cultures. Uh, connections to other content areas. Oh, I love Priscilla, great comment. You, you noticed um, within cultures, the three, the, the three Ps, so products, practices, and perspectives. So we could certainly see we're gonna look at some products, maybe think about the perspectives that are behind those products, some of the stereotypes that me, absolutely, that's a really important uh, thing to note as well. For connections, so remember connections, I think is the confusing C to other content areas. Um, I think really anything in this unit, um, Oh, Grant Scott, learning about marketing. I didn't even think of that one. That's a great point. Making a social media campaign, we could connect to a, a business or marketing. Uh, but certainly, I think there may be some um, sort of current event things that might be coming in. The use of technology, great point. You're making a social media campaign. So we can see how we're connecting to a couple other um, content areas. Uh, comparisons is the next one. And remember, that's thinking a lot more about like cultural comparisons in particular. Um, some students will say, I've had people comment, maybe this could be a little bit richer in this example. Um, she's got them comparing other Span different Spanish speaking countries. Um, we might want to make sure, are they also comparing to their own culture? Um, but hopefully that's included in here, but that's a piece of the comparisons. Communities is the challenging C because we, it's hard to find those authentic communities to connect learners with. Um, but we can see here sort of she's got them um, uh, at least putting what they've created, the social media, out online potentially. So helping learners go beyond the classroom, um, thinking about communities. Um, so this IPA, so again, for me, it went from, um, you know, my textbook days of these sort of I mean, grammar, which are like, oh, that that's like a piece of the um, communication C. It's in there, but it's not the only thing. And the textbook felt just like it was grammar was the only thing we were focusing on. And then the other C's were sort of maybe there or not to now this sort of authentic frame that really weaves them together nicely. Um, so if I'm looking at curriculum design, for me, this is where I start. I'm like, how are we gonna get learners? To, what is a theme we want them to investigate? And what is sort of an authentic context that we can help them explore using this IPA as the frame? So let me share a little bit more information on, um, on how that framework, now that we've looked at the IPA, um, can, um, can be used. Grant, can you just give me a thumbs up? I seem, oh, I'm back. I see myself frozen and I got a little nervous for a second, but I'm moving again. So hopefully everyone can still can see me. So how can I use this framework to structure my curricular unit? Um, so we saw this example from my student. So part of this um, was determining what, um, what course was that for? What her proficiency target for that course was? How she wanted learners performing? Um, and again, you're gonna get these slides, but her entire unit, as well as a couple examples from some of my other students are shared on our website. So you can, uh, when you get the slides, uh, you're welcome to, to find, to get a copy of that. But she said, okay, this is a second year course, the proficiency target, I want learners achieving intermediate low by the end of the year, which means they should be doing intermediate level performances throughout the year to get there. Um, uh, my theme is gender equality and gender expectations. Um, we could connect it to an AP theme or ACTFL has what they call um, global world language themes. Um, I have my students also look at the UN Sustainable Development Goals um, and think about how it connects there. So that's why you see those three themes uh, on, in the lower box there articulated. So she would use that frame for her entire curricular unit. Um, she worked on some essential questions for this unit. 
you know, what it, what were the things she wanted learners investigating that were connected to that IPA frame? Um, and finally, identified a specific performance objective. She wanted learners to identify, analyze, and present information on gender expectations, gender roles, gender equality, and the use of inclusive language, <clears throat> excuse me, using simple sentences with details and transitional phrases. Um, in the unit, if you do go to our website, you're going to see a lot more detail in the specific um, objectives for this unit, as well as like a sequence of learning. But I wanted to just give a little bit of an overview of how that framework can be used on like on the front end of designing your um, your curriculum. Let me talk a little bit about how this unit would flow then, because I said earlier that the mistake I made, and I think a lot of us has, have made, is putting the IPA at the end. So giving the whole summative assessment, those three separate assessments at the very end of the unit. And it took me over a week and it was exhausting. I would advocate embedding it throughout the unit. So when you actually start teaching this unit, Really, we're starting with a heavier focus on interpretive communication. We're building their, vo their vocabulary. We're having them read um, and listen and view a lot of those authentic resources. So in this case, looking at what are some examples of this gender inclusive language she's talking about from Argentina? How did all of that work? So they're doing a lot of sort of reading or uh, listening and discussing of what they've read earlier in the unit. And then at some point, let's let's just, to make life easy, let's pretend this is a six week unit. So I spend two weeks on the first chunk, really heavy emphasis on interpretive. And then I decide to give the interpretive assessment. Um, I pick an authentic resource and I develop the comprehension questions and I administer it. So part one, and that's maybe like a quiz grade or however you feel is appropriate. Then I shift to a heavier focus on interpersonal. So we've learned a lot about this. Now we're gonna engage in discussions, debate, um, you know, maybe taking pr different perspectives on the topic, um, have a, a heavier emphasis here on interaction. And then at some point I'm going to say, okay, now we're going to film a conversation you two are having, or we're gonna use the language lab if you have access to one or a recording app on your phone to have an audio conversation. Um, and that's gonna count as your assessment for um, interpersonal. And now we're gonna shift gears in the last two weeks of the unit and we're gonna develop that social media campaign. You've learned a ton, you've talked a lot about it. They've got good use of the vocabulary, good use of whatever the structures are we're working on. And now they're gonna sit down and start uh, writing what they want to create, writing whatever they want for the social media, creating those social media things, et cetera. Um, uh, and that would be my final assessment. The presentational for me always feels a little bit more like a project, which when I started with something, I was doing a lot of projects so that feels a little bit more like project based that might feel more, more familiar, but that might be a more of a focus on and presentational can be a writing, it can be a video, um, it can be uh, any number of things, these things as long as it's sort of one way for an audience or we're creating a website or whatever it may be. Um, so that's how I would sort of think about sequencing the unit so that those the three pieces of the IPA are within the unit, not all the way at the end, and it's something I can sort of more reasonably do and have time to give learners feedback. So this would be sort of the structure of how that unit would unfold. Um, and thank you, a little plug for extempore in the chat. Um, so that's sort of a, a, a structure for using this IPA. Um, so we'll take a pause here for sort of a qu questions or um, any share outs. Um, I see a question from Erin. Do you have them work on presentational tasks in class or outside of class? That's an excellent question. Um, what I would recommend, particularly for anything, I mean, presentational, even if it's presentational speaking, um, I might have them write that that's presentational. There's an editing aspect. They're allowed to edit and correct, right? I would, I'm sort of an advocate as much as I love technology for any writing tasks. I'm like, give them a pen, a pencil and paper and do it in class and, but chunk it so that they at least have a draft. Um, and you've got time for peer feedback, teacher feedback, share outs. You could have uh, an example of what they've written projected and you can do a collaborative kind of correcting or feedback together as a class. Um, but I would, I would kind of go old school when you're working on that, if that helps. Um, and then maybe the final touches they can do at home. The risk, of course, is that there's um, 
some uh, Google Translate or whatever it might be going on. Um, I'm going to answer Parker's question that came up first, and then Martha, I see your hand as well. Um, grading the interpretive as a quiz, would three tasks not count as a major assessment? Um, there's not, so how would I do this? Or there's different ways. So what I would say is there's different ways. Um, however, there's not a right answer to your question. Um, personally, I feel like um, the way I liked to organize my grade book was my mode of communication. Um, so if it's, you know, 30, 30, 30, and then 10% for, um, uh, for sort of um, professionalism. So like arriving on time to class, doing, you know, to whatever, whatever you might feel is appropriate. So I could put that interpretive as a quiz in, um, in the interpretive category, interpersonal and presentational. I also tended to do points, um, but it, that's where it's really up to you. Uh, you can, you can organize it however you want. Um, I do think it's a major. This is the, the summative of the assessment, but it's in smaller chunks throughout um, would be how I would recommend it. Um, I see other questions in the chat, but Martha had her hand up next. Go ahead. Thanks. And I see that Rachel and I are in the same boat. Um, I teach level one eighth graders, so they're already feeling totally awkward. Um, and I, they really don't have the language to do a lot of interpersonal or presentational at the start of the year. So I've been very heavily focused on interpretive, but thinking about trying to embed just little bite size, mini bits of interpersonal using a lot of chat mats, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and I think presentational is probably easier for novices than interpersonal because you can prepare and you're not right. relying on any spontaneous responses from anyone. Um, yeah. But this, what you're looking at here is more for level two, yes? The example shared here was a second year, correct. Okay, um, but would you advocate trying to do an IPA with all three modes, even at the novice level at the beginning I, of the year? I, I would, and I, I agree with what you're saying. In a novice level class, um, so I'm actually, I'm trying to think if there's uh, one of my student examples on the website that I shared is for a novice. I think yes, actually, yeah. I think there's a French example um, for on the website from one of my students. Um, so you're welcome to explore that, but no, absolutely. So I'm actually working on a, like a large scale curriculum project for the Boston public schools. And we're starting with novice. So year one high school, um, across languages, and we're using this framework. So the first unit, of course, I mean, the sort of typical introduce yourself, et cetera. Right. So learners need a ton of scaffolding, as you mentioned, the chat mats, et cetera. They need a ton of scaffolding. But they're novices and novices are like the parents. So they're using a lot of the structures you've given them for language, but they are still engaging in some kind of interpersonal where they need to listen and answer the question like, hello, how are you? I'm good. What's your name? My name is, you know, so it might feel like a simple scripted conversation, but that's where they're starting. Right. Um, and then in the Second unit, I uh, I forget if we got into a social community or family, like rethinking a family unit into like a community. Who are who are my communities? Who am I in my communities? Um, so I would say at novice, I think you need to think really carefully about what the language expectations are, um, so that you're not overshooting. I think we are we are like oh we want to make it so engaging, yes, but they don't have the length. You know how can I really simplify it? Um, exactly. Does that help a little bit. Oh, yeah, a lot. Um, I'm a big believer in, you know, Rebecca Blue Wolf said once in a webinar, just because something is linguistically yeah. simple doesn't mean that it's not cognitively rich. Exactly. So I kind of live by that. And we engage in a lot of complex conversations, but it's me doing most of the talking and them answering yes or no, or either or, or with a question word, et cetera. So yeah. I don't mind maintaining that structure because I feel like I get them a lot more rich input. Yeah. Um, but I want them to be used to output, even in tiny bite sizes earlier in the year. Yeah. Oh, so. yeah. Yeah. Level one, like everybody's got their favorites. For me, first year is my sweet spot. Like I oh. loved freshmen. Boy, I, I don't know. Other people are like, oh, my God. But that was like my favorite class. Day one, level one, like my mantra, they're talking, they're leaving. It's a memorized scripted conversation, whatever. But they're leaving the class with, hello, how are you? What's your name? You know, like, 
from first day, they can do that. And then you're kind of expanding it. Mm -hmm. um, it is, like you said, lots of support, lots of structures. They're using lots of memorized chunks, um, but that's what they need. Um, when we're So I'll last comment on novice and then I'll um, move on. If we have a class where we're trying to get them to novice high, of course, that means they need to be doing things, performing like an intermediate, but with support. With, and that is like simple sentences, simple questions. So you're helping them do that so they can build up to novice high because the novice high looks like an intermediate most of the time, but they just can't sustain it. Um, so having them engage in that with all of the supports you're giving them as early as possible, I think is really key on accelerating their proficiency development. So that's a great question. Thank you so much, Martha. I'm in math um, too, by the way, Catherine. Sorry? I'm in Massachusetts also. Oh, oh whereabouts? Um, Rockport near Glasgow. Oh, nice. Awesome. Yes. Awesome. I was up in there earlier this summer. Yeah. yeah. We'd love to see some samples of what you're doing for BPS. <laughs> yes. Yes. I hope to be able to share some of those. Um, okay. So I'll, I'll move on because I want to look at the lesson level a little bit more. But think about, again, there's some examples from my students on the website. Um, uh, and I think more and more, if you're looking at, if you have the IPA book, I would sort of step back and think about how would this be a whole unit? How am I, how can I use this for the theme of an entire unit and kind of tying this all together? Um, curriculum work is slow. It's, I, I think it works best when it's a collaborative process um, that's happening across the district, but this can be a really rewarding and enriching and engaging um, uh, framework uh, to, to to think about your curriculum. But let me shift a little bit and think about how we could use it on a lesson level. So within the context of a daily lesson, how can I use this, this model um, to, to think about how I'm structuring my lessons? Um, so I'm just reading the last question before I move on. The extent to which they provide students and instructors with real purposeful communicative opportunities, et cetera. Is pretending truly authentic? Yes. So great question and fair question, Jason. Um, we are not an authentic language learning environment, right? So we're in a classroom. It's artificial from the get-go. There's sort of the constraints that we're not, why would I talk to my friend here in this language when they speak English? So we're sort of forcing uh, communication on them in a language that's artificial, uh, that, that would never be used between those two speakers, um, given the context that they're in. So for me anyway, that's sort of the starting point. My goal with the frameworks is to ensure those, those, those task frames is to show learners how they could use the language in an authentic context. It should feel like this is something I could really engage in, um, that's at least for me been something that's important. Uh, but but you're right. We're not. We don't have the luxury of like the English language learners uh, or ESL teachers where the kids are just have to use the language. They see the purpose of communication. So we're trying to create that context for them. That might not totally get at your concerns, Jason. But that's sort of my been my take on it. Um, so let's think about a lesson level. Um, and I'm going to share with you a model that does basically the same thing as the IPA, um, but at a lesson level. And that is really that it takes interpretive and links it to interpersonal and then can link it to presentational. So you're taking whatever that theme is and you're, you're, you're looking at it um, across the modes of communication. Um, so the interactive model um, is something uh, that has also been around for, for a while. This is like the teaching model that I'm completely obsessed with. Um, and again, it's because it connects those three modes so seamlessly. Um, and it starts with an authentic resource, preferably, ideally, if we have access to one or we found one that really works well. There's times where we might want to bring in a teacher-made resource, and that's okay. Uh, but of course, we're striving for authentic resources throughout. Um, and it ties those three modes together. And a lot of the, one of the big questions I hear from teachers who are shifting from more, maybe more traditional approaches to teaching uh, that had more of a sort of a grammar focus to proficiency-based instruction is like, well, what is my daily learning? How does, how do my lessons unfold? Like, what do I do? And for me, this model has been just sort of really uh, fundamental. Um, 
I'm not going to get into grammar. It's beyond the scope of this presentation, but there's a way that I would use this model to fold in a teach a focus on grammar. Um, you can fold in focus on writing. There's just ways you can adapt the model, but that's again beyond the scope of this uh, of our work today. But let's take a look at the interactive model and hopefully you feel like, hey, I think I'm doing, I'm doing most of this. Uh, for me, there were, as I learned about this, I was like, you know, I'm doing most of this, but there's like one or two phases that I think I've been forgetting about or I need to pay more attention to. So hopefully it feels familiar, maybe reinforces a lot of what you're doing, but also maybe reminds you of some areas that you want to make sure you're paying attention to. So essentially we're starting with what is our resource? So let's say we're on the gender inclusive theme. Uh, I have this great infographic that I found. So I, I've got an authentic resource. I want my learners to read this. I think it's appropriate for their proficiency level. But before I have them just read it, I'm not gonna open class and be like, okay guys, read this. I have to establish a meaning. Why are we reading this? What is the point of reading this? Is there some key vocab they need to learn that I need to pre-teach so that they can access the resource and be successful with it? Um, you know, do I need, I need to anticipate vocabulary, so some content maybe that they're like, you know, they're probably not familiar with this. I need to build their background knowledge, essentially. So we start with this preparation. How am I getting them ready before we read the resource? And that could take 10 minutes. That could take 30 minutes. It depends on your level and what the resource is. Then we, now, okay, now that we've gotten you ready for it, and I've said what, kind of why we're reading this, et cetera, we're going to actually read it. But what's important here is we're going to read this twice, and we have a goal for why we're reading it. Um, is step one in the target language? Everything's in the target language. <laughs> I would 100% do this in the target language. Yes. Uh, yeah, I would say if you feel you need to do this in English, the resource is too hard for them. You need to pick a, a different resource. So I would absolutely uh, use the target language throughout this. Um, so I've prepared them uh, uh, with the exception, Erin, sorry, the exception, my learning objective for the lesson, I would feel comfortable putting that in English. So I can, you know, whatever, I can explain uh, different gender pronoun, whatever it is, I could put that in English, but the rest of it, I would, I would say, keep it in the target language. So now we're going to interpret and read this resource, or it could be viewing or listening, but I'm just going to say reading for simplicity. So learners should be actively reading this twice. And they need to be doing something. That's what's important. So it's not just, okay, read this and then let's talk about it. I want you to read this. And as you read this, maybe I'm gonna have you fill out a graphic organizer and I want you looking for something as you read. Okay, guys, what did you find? Now we're gonna read it again. And I want you to add to your graphic organizer and look for these other things that you might not have noticed the first time. So, so learners really need two passes at whatever, at, at least two passes at it. And you're asking them to do something and go a little bit deeper from the first to the second read. So how are they actively engaged? And this should be connected to why you're having them read this in the first place. Now that we've, and again, that could take if it's a really short one, maybe that's 10 minutes, or maybe that's a 20 minute activity where they're reading it, you're having a little share out on what they read for the first time. Okay, now read it again and look for this. Now we're shifting into interpretation uh, and discussion. So you've read this, you've had, let's for example, I've had you fill out this graphic organizer where you were looking for specific things. With a partner, now I want you, so now we're inter from interpretive to interpersonal. Uh, talk about, here's some key questions I want you to talk about with your partner connected to the resource. Um, so this can be another way to, um, so you're moving from interpretive, you're using what you learned or interpretive to have some interpersonal discussion. To be honest with you, stages one, two, and three, that would be possibly a full lesson right there. Let's say if you've got a 50 minute class or something like that, that's a whole, that could be an entire class depending on the level. Uh, novice might not be a full class, but um, I might do a half class of that and then we're working on to something else. Um, but that could be a whole lesson right there. And then tomorrow we're gonna come back in and now we're gonna read another resource on the same topic. So now I had you read an infographic yesterday. Now we're going to watch a video on this. Um, we're going to do the same thing. I'm going to prepare you for it. We're going to read it or view it twice, being actively engaged. And now we're going to discuss what we read or viewed. Um, so that's the extension. And we can extend as many times as we feel is appropriate. Finally, we get into creativity. I want them to use what they've learned and apply it in a creative product. So in the IPA, that, that third phase was, we said maybe that could be two weeks, they're creating this larger social media campaign. But in a daily lesson, it could be just something much smaller. So I could have them create 
uh, right, uh, so here we've read some social media posts, for example, uh, on this topic. We've interpreted them, we've discussed them. So they've had lots of input. They've gotten lots of examples of what this looks like. Okay, now I want you to take, take 10 minutes and write a couple that you might wanna say on this topic. And you're giving them a framework and they're writing in there. Um, so the presentational on a lesson level could be something a little bit more uh, chunked down, much more, uh, much smaller. Um, so that can be something that, um, that they use. And again, this could be um, uh, a structure for, um, for lessons in this proficiency-based model, particularly when you're focusing more on that in heavier interpretive um, into interpersonal phase. Um, we uh, included this graphic or table in our book, um, but it shows how you might use this for a week long. So it's not, it's just an example to give a flow of how that structure could be used. Um, where we're starting with, uh, let's say Monday, we've got one authentic resource. Um, we're preparing them. We're having them read and interpret. Again, active engagement. We're discussing it. Tomorrow, Tuesday, we come in, we're looking at a different authentic resource on the same thing. And that could continue. And Friday, we're like, okay, today we've looked at, we've read all these great things. We're going to work on this small presentational. I'm going to have you write a response. I'm going to have you um, make a short video, not maybe as elaborate as the larger assessment that would come through the IPA, uh, but still something that would focus on developing their presentational skills. Um, I want to do what, get, share a, a, an example uh, from, again, this one's in our book. This is from uh, a colleague of mine here at BU. Um, and he had a theme, and now this is a university level course on healthcare, um, and he had a lot of different uh, objectives. So for each of these objectives here, these are his daily learning objectives. Um, he had learners working with different authentic resources on the same theme. So they were reading um, different articles on healthcare. Um, and bring, so because it's a university course, what he had them do was the reading ahead of class with the active engagement and come in and use the time together more for the interpersonal discussion. Um, so there's ways that you can adapt it depending on what, um, what your goals are for, for the unit. So I've just shared a lot of information on that um, lesson level way to use the IPA, again, moving from interpretive to interpersonal to presentational that's connected. So I'll pause again for a couple questions uh, to see what, uh, what questions that might have sparked for you. Again, either in the chat or feel free to raise your hand. Um, and if people are already using a version of this, um, I'd love to hear that as well. That would be certainly very interesting also. Any questions on, um, on the interactive model or how that fits with the IPA or people using it. All right. Well, not hearing any, let me share some resources with you. Um, so we shared at the beginning um, the book Proficiency-Based Instruction um, that I published with my colleague, Christina Toro. Um, so we go into much deeper detail of that, uh, of the uh, using the IPA as a curriculum framework, as well as using it as a, as a lesson uh, framework um, throughout the book. Um, and I had touched quickly on the question of grammar. There is a chapter that specifically looks at that, using that model to embed a focus on uh, form and context. So that's definitely something uh, that might be helpful for you. The Implementing Integrated Performance Assessment book um, has just come out with a new edition. Um, the one you see here is the second edition. I only just got my hands on the third latest edition um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, I'm very excited to see the new examples they've shared, but um, that's another one that would be really helpful if you're looking at a curriculum process. Um, that might be something that uh, would be helpful for you and thinking about that framework. Um, and then uh, enacting the work of language instruction, high leverage teaching practices by Gleason and Donato um, is another one that I find um, they, they talk about the um, 
interactive model. Um, it's a little bit more of a research base. So if you're curious, like, well, what is, what's, what's some of a research background on this? Um, they do additionally have rubrics um, uh, and some specific examples. Um, but I think there's, uh, if, if it's a little bit more of a research heavy book, but that's another great one uh, for, as a resource for you all. Um, any other questions? I have, we have about 15 minutes. I'm happy to have sort of open discussion on any of these topics or other things people are wondering about before we wrap up. I have a kind of an off topic question. So if somebody else has an on topic question, please go first. No, you go ahead. It's okay. You you're, go, go for it. Okay, so I teach at a university in Oklahoma, which is um, a long way from Massachusetts physically and sort of mentally. And trying to implement things like this in my kind of small department is like, I mean, most of my colleagues are still so stuck on grammar. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, do you find that more and more, or maybe it's just not in Oklahoma, more universities are using this type of proficiency-based instruction. Do you think most of them are still stuck in grammar? I'm just kind of curious what your read on the on the sort of climate yeah. is. I don't think it's unique to Oklahoma or you, your <laughs> university. Um, so you're in good company. And I don't think it's unique to universities. I think it's pretty widespread. Um, I think uh, the, the hold that grammar and the teaching of grammar has on our profession is pretty deep and pretty strong. Um, and I can share my own experience. Um, uh, I was in the public schools, uh, for almost 14, 15 years and went through, um, a curriculum redesign using this framework. Uh, and what you're talking about happens at that level as well. And now I'm at a university, so I'm a methods instructor, so I'm not in the language program, but I can see what's happening over there and it's, it's the same. So I think we're sort of, there's a butting of heads with a more traditional, uh, grammar-based approach and the thematic approach that could use, um, the IPA as its framework. Um, my experience with doing this is. Uh, I, I did it as a pilot with the people who were interested in working on it. So that was sort of rather than, and I had the luxury of being the department head. So I could say, we're doing this, who would like to participate and was able to get some small, I mean, public school funds is not, or is very little, very small amount of funds to give people mini, minuscule after school stipends to do some of this work. Um, but what I found was starting with the people who were interested once they became sort of the ambassadors and then other teachers who'd been a little more reluctant kind of saw what they were doing and got excited. And then the department meetings, I kind of got to sit back a little bit and let them talk and them do the advocating for me. And then really what was the most exciting part was when we started testing students. So we used uh, STAMP and the Apple test to, put, to get some samples of student data. And when we saw how students were doing, that was like the, the the teachers that were the most resistant when they saw the results from the students. And when they, I remember a, a high school Spanish teacher who had been, she was okay, but she, let's, she was sort of just going along and saying what I wanted to hear. But when she taught freshmen, span, um, a lot of freshmen, when she got those middle school kids who'd been doing this kind of uh, proficiency-based instruction with these themes, when she got them in her class, she was like, oh my God, she, she was floored. She's like, they can talk. They can actually talk. They can interact. It was very transformative for her. So I think that's when the buy-in really started. So I don't know for you in your situation in Oklahoma, but are, is there at least one colleague who might want to pilot something with you and just say, hey, we want to try this. You know, what I've learned at the university level, I mean, already there's not enough time in a public school, you know, the public school system, there's not enough time, right? But it's even less at the university. Um, so it's really challenging. So how many units you can accomplish, um, that, that's, that's something. But I think there is the, the resistance is real. Um, and, you know, to say, to be fair, they're saying, hey, this has worked for us. Why do we need to change? So it's just sort of acknowledge like, there's things that are wonderful in what you're doing, and we feel there's there's a different approach that is going to really help 
learners um, engage and develop their language skills. Uh, you know, the enrollment numbers was another big convincer. So in my public school program, the year that I, we were on the brink of cutting AP Spanish. We had like eight students sign up for advanced placement in Spanish. And I just talked to, so actually Christina, my co-author, they've got uh, 55 students in AP Spanish now. So it, within a couple of years, the students stay with it longer because they're getting what they want. So the student experience is another powerful um, way to help change people's thinking around it. University programs are suffering. The cuts to world language programs at the universities nationwide is extensive. Um, and really scary. So like, hey, we wanna not only keep our students, we wanna grow our students. Is there a space for um, a pilot to try this out and see how it goes? I don't know if that helps your question at all, but that's been my experience. No, I appreciate that. I, it's glad to know that I'm not alone. <laughs> You're not alone. <laughs> and the do you, grammar- Do you also think, and here's my other question. So like, I'm the only French instructor for the first four semesters of French. And by the end of fourth semester, they're supposed to be at the intermediate, mid, intermediate, high level. Do you, I mean, is yeah. that, okay. So I'm not crazy to think that that's You're not just crazy. a great, okay. Fourth semester French. So that's two years, correct? So you have yeah. two, yeah, no. Um, there's some formulas you can look at. Um, Maybe I'll pop that. I have a chart. You know what? As soon as we get off, I'm going to put this in the resource folder with you because there's like a mathematical formula to figure out how many hours of instruction will equal what reasonable proficiency level. Yeah. Uh, 130, 155 hours in one year, which so again, my I'm primarily like a K-12 world despite being in the university, which is like a one year level one. They should achieve novice high. So what you're talking about the university are your first and semester courses equaling that amount. And then a, a possible reasonable target could be novice high for year one. Year two, possible reasonable target would be intermediate low. So yeah. to say they're intermediate high, I mean, it, it just doesn't add up. It's not, that's not how language is acquired, sadly. I know, and it's, it's like, and these, you know, a lot of my colleagues are PhDs and they've been teaching for many, many years, right? but yet they still have this expectation. Oh, the kids are gonna get there. I'm like, well, those aren't real beginners if they've gotten there. Yeah. So side side topic. Um, I, I, I yes, Mar I will put that chart in. Um, and I appreciate Jason's comment in the chat as well. If we don't change, yeah, the students will vote with their feet. So they will. I mean, we're seeing declining enrollments uh, at universities and so on. But it's they. The the good news of proficiency based instruction, I think, is that. Our goals, which is that we want the learners to speak and communicate, align with their goals. So why are you taking this class in the first place? I want to communicate. I want to speak. I want to speak the language. Well, good. So I want you to speak the language. So we just need to merge those together and help the learners um, uh, uh, want to stick with it. So I have taken, I'm a language nerd, as I'm sure everyone here is. I love language. Um, I taught French and Spanish. Um, and I've, I, I recently during COVID again, we were all going a little crazy and some of the courses at BU were taught remotely. I got back into German, which I've studied for many years and the German professors were fabulous. And then I took a semester on campus as well when we came back, but honestly that it was the third semester German. I was like, this is asking me to do advanced material. And I can't do it. I, I'm trying really hard, but it was too much, too fast. So my, and my experience was like, I just, I'm, I got, I passed the class. I got, I was like, I'm, you know, type A, I'm getting my A, whatever. I didn't need, I'm just doing it for fun, but I, that's how I am. And, but it was like, I'm like, this is not aligned. I'm like, I I'm intermediate low at best. And you're asking me to advance, to do advanced work. So there is an issue of alignment and and the students know it and they will they will not continue. And that's the opposite of what we want. Um, but yeah, great point, you know, we want, yeah, they wanna communicate, we want them to communicate. So that's really uh, what's exciting with all of this. But it is a process. Um, it is, it it's, takes time to change minds, but I think we should be engaging with it to the extent what, 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 what's your realm of control? Are you have control of your own class? Is there someone you can collaborate with, do a pilot, try to engage in this work um, to move learners forward. But it's really meaningful when you, uh, when you do. 
Um, I agree and disagree, Jason, with the authentic material. Yes and no. So yes and no. There's a lot of authentic resources that are super simple. So you it, just like when we're using comprehensible language with learners, we use strategies such as visuals, uh, body language, you're choosing cognate, you might use cognates, um, repetition, et cetera. We can use those same comprehensible input skills or strategies and apply them to an authentic resource. So I can choose an authentic resource that is heavy on visuals, has a nice organizational structure for which learners might bring a lot of background knowledge to um, that can be easily comprehensible. Um, even at a novice. So to take a simple example that probably everyone's familiar with, you might have seen or probably have seen um, my plate from the government where it's this circle plate with the color sections and then they point to the different food elements that you should be eating. And it'll be like fruit, vegetables, protein or whatever with the color code. You can get these in Spanish and I think other languages. A novice can read that. Um, I don't speak, you know, I probably could get a sense of what is said on that resource in Arabic or Chinese, which I do not speak. Why? Because it's a really clear organizational structure. I have background knowledge. I have familiarity with it. The visual is clear and direct. Um, so picking good authentic resources can be used in, with novice classes. I think where the challenge is, it takes time to find those resources. Um, so I'm a, an, a fan of, you know, cutting yourself a break. You're looking for a good resource. You say, you know, I've been looking for a while. I don't have time to keep looking. I'm going to use it. I'm going to supplement with a teacher made resource while I build my resource bank. So I hear you. And I think it is possible if we choose carefully, uh, but we sh also shouldn't beat ourselves up if we're not uh, able to find one, uh, given the, all the other pressures that we have as educators. Um, I see that my time is starting to run out. Um, I want to just check in on, um, yeah, great point. Um, uh, I don't know if it's Gisela or Gisela. I have a German colleague whose name is Gisela. Sorry if I mispronounced uh, your name. Uh, you don't need to use a full article. You use the title of it. There's different things that you can do. Um, absolutely. Uh, but certainly it's something to aspire to. Uh, and we love those infographics. So I hope through this presentation, you feel that you, you have a sense of this uh, and can explain hopefully the sequence and stages of the integrated performance assessment um, and think about how it could describe how it could be used as a framework to design both those learning sequences we talked about as well as the curricular units. And I really hope you feel you could begin to apply this given all of the challenges that we just talked about uh, of the realities of maybe where some of our colleagues are and the challenges we might experience in the classroom. But I hope that you can start to apply this framework um, in your own teaching. And I wish you great success, you and your students, great success on your proficiency-based instruction journey. You can do it. And I know that your students deserve it. Um, thank you so much for coming. I will put the slides as well as that chart that I mentioned with the proficiency targets um, in the folder in a mere moment. And let me just make sure I put that link in the chat one more time. Um, and I know Grant will be sharing it out as well. So thank you for having me, Grant. And thank you all uh, for coming. Yes, hold on, let me stop.